the, that's the graph we're going to make. Uh, x to the fourth minus 12x cubed plus 48x squared minus 64x. Now, I, I've put the axes kind of off center because I already know where a majority of the graph is going to be. So if, if you're trying to set up axes on a piece of paper, that'd be about the same. Um, how many do these have? It's probably like 50 squares or something, I would guess. Maybe not 50, 40. I believe if I remember right, it goes down to like negative 30-ish. So you can either make your graph on a scale or set it up correctly. What are you doing? Can't be that tired. OK. I, it looks like I already know our first volunteer. I gotta wake you up. <clears throat> Off on the right hand side, you'll see all the different things that we're trying to figure out before we graph it. And it's a lot of stuff. It's, uh, it's essentially everything and anything we've learned how to do by hand about an equation. And then that's what allows us to make a nice, accurate graph without a calculator. And I, honestly, these aren't going to be difficult. They're just extremely time consuming. So when we do get to our test next week, my guess is we'll probably have it set up where the first day is just going to be the second derivative test and our next section, which is called optimization. We'll do that on one day. And then the second day, I'll have you do this, just so you're not so crunched for time. Um, It'll probably be only two problems on this, like your test. Yeah? Were there like 5.1 to 5.3 in test? No. Well, not currently planned. I haven't written the test, so. Uh, if I do plan on putting some on there, I would let you know. If I were smart, I could have printed this out for you ahead of time, huh? Because this takes forever to write down. Yeah. Plus, the other reason I like splitting up the test into two days is because, for sure, this entire thing is meant to be non-calculator. But the other questions, I could certainly try to set them up using calculator, and then we'd, it'd be separated. Uh, Aiden, while you are writing stuff down, can you remind everybody how to find the x-intercepts? That will be difficult, um, given that we're trying to graph it. So we won't be able to see where it crosses. We're trying to figure out where it crosses. How do we do it by hand? OK, good. So that'll be our first step. Okay, set it equal to zero. So I've got, oh, my pen's all reset. So I've got x to the fourth minus 12x cubed 
plus 48x squared minus 64x equal to 0. Uh, immediately, I know I can factor out an x. Okay, Aiden, I'm hoping, I don't know if you're going to remember this next part or not. This definitely was in pre-calc, first learned in LG2. How do you figure out factors of something like this? Does anybody remember how we figure out the factors? Uh, we could try that. Uh, it's not going to work, though. Because I see it would be 1 and 12, and then 4 and something. So it's not the right ratio for factor by grouping. But that four terms definitely is, that's the one way to try it. Do you remember how to come up with the factor, the zero? There we go. Synthetic division. OK, now the downside, 64 has a lot of factors. So we're probably going to be doing a lot of erasing here. So I've got 1, negative 12, 48, negative 64. And then we're going to synthetically divide by the opposite of the factor, so the root number rather than the factor. And uh, we pretty much just guess. I will probably just. Let's just go with 4, because 4 seems like 64. 4 goes in there, what, 16 times? Yeah, that's 4 cubed. Let's go with 4. 1, 4. Do you, want, do you want me to say this out loud how to do it? Do you guys remember it? No, as in don't remember it? OK, I'll back up. Synthetic division, you bring down the first number, multiply it times the box, write your answer in the next spot. Add down. Multiply times the box. Add, oh, this might actually work right away. I was not expecting that. Um, yeah, it did. Well, shoot, I was kind of hoping to like do it like two, three times just to refresh you on there. Uh, but I accidentally found the factor immediately. Yes? And so you know that you can't do this thing the Correct. Yeah, it's, you know it's a factor if it divides evenly and a remainder is 0. If it has a remainder, it does not divide evenly, and it wouldn't be a factor of it. OK, so I know I have x. I know I have x minus 4, because I just found out 4 was a root. These numbers at the bottom of synthetic division tell you what's left. This is going to be plus 16 minus 8x plus 1x squared. So you basically start from the right, work your way to the left, and then it goes up in power each time. And x squared minus 8x plus 16, I can factor right away as well without needing to do synthetic. So this is going to be x minus 4, x minus 4. This is actually terrible. Um, all right, well, let's go with it. Did you guys talk about multiplicity of roots last year? If you have an odd number of factors, like I have three x minus fours. <clears throat> if you have an odd number of a factor, it will cross through the x-axis. If you have an even number of them, like x minus four squared, it would bounce off the x-axis. Probably talked about it, but not too much. Yeah. So. I'm just bringing that up because obviously I'm going to need to know that info. Well, now I found all my intercepts, so I, I only have two x-intercepts, 0 and 4. All right, got my first answer. Um, I probably shouldn't write them that way. X-intercepts are actually points, so I'm probably better off writing them as points, 0, 0, 4, 0. <clears throat> Aiden, who's going to go next? Oh, okay. Well, next one. Y-intercept. Um, you put zero for all the x's, 
Perfect. Put zero in place of x, and that will be zero. Now, if we were thinking about this ahead of time, we could have figured out that the x-intercept of 0, 0 is also the y-intercept, because that's the origin. And there can only be one y-intercept, so. But that one's re usually really easy to figure out, so it's not like a big deal if you just plug 0 in. OK, uh, next person. Correct. Do you remember what domain is? So we, we dealt with it on that last question of the test when I put it up yesterday. We couldn't use any numbers that were bigger than two on that question. So domain is you trying to figure out what numbers you're able to put into this equation. So like, are there any numbers that would make it undefined? Like, uh, that's usually what you look for. So on this one, it's a polynomial. Any number can be put in place of x. No matter what number we use, we wouldn't, get, we wouldn't get divided by 0. We wouldn't get anything weird. So this one, the domain is all reals. Where the domain will come into play usually is if you have like vertical asymptotes. And that's usually where you see it. Uh, well, that's the next question. So I guess, uh, UK, who's going to help me out with vertical asymptotes? 22? Brendan? None? If your domain is all reals, then there definitely can't be any vertical asymptotes. NA. Let's get you guys used to job applications. We'll do NA. Not applicable. When I was in school, you know, because job applications were actually like fill out by hand, they weren't online. We, they made us learn how to fill out job applications, and this was the biggest thing. You write NA if something didn't apply to you. You can't leave a job application slot blank. Uh, Brandon, who's next? 14. You guys are making me work. Ellen, what's the N behavior? Oh. Uh, so it is an even-powered function. So similar to parabolas, what would a parabola do on the outside? Uh, correct. How about this one? So I'm guessing in your head you were trying to picture x squared, though, right? Oh, OK, you should. So if it's an even function, you would picture x squared because they're all similar. <coughs> x squared goes up on both sides. Un unless, how do, which, when would it point down? Yeah, okay, so how about this one? Okay, so the end behavior would be up on both sides. Now, we theoretically, I shouldn't have written end behavior because that's like the algebra 2 pre-calc term. I should have written the limit as x approaches infinity and the limit as x approaches negative infinity because that's technically what n behavior is. But for both of them, the answer would have been infinity because it's going up on both sides. So I am just going to draw arrows to save time here. What time do we get done? 15, OK. Sure, we can finish this problem by then. I'm going to guess we'll do one today, yeah. I believe on the test, I think I have it listed as limit as x approaches infinity, limit as x approaches negative infinity. So that way, it's a little more specific. Uh, oh, wait. Who's, yeah, go ahead. How did, can you go through how you uh, found out why that term is happening? Uh, because it's a polynomial, even functions and odd functions behave differently. Even functions will go up on both sides unless there's a negative in the front, and then it would be upside down. Odd functions, like in your head if you picture x cubed, they will all behave like that. The middle, the middle is always different. We don't care about the middle, though. But an odd function will always look like this unless it has a negative in the front, and then it would be flipped. But, and that only applies to polynomials. So that's the main reason why end behavior isn't going to be a great term, because if we have 
a rational expression that could be different. So. Yeah. That's why we're starting off with polynomials. More straightforward. Wait, who just went? Bella, did you just go? Who's going to go next? Noah. First derivative. Oh, shoot. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. I got the eraser on. Oh dear. Uh, I'm just going to do the scratch work right here and then erase it. Because we're going to need to figure out critical numbers, which is what? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, Fianna, I know you're sort of retired. But you are the expert on critical numbers. How do we find those? Perfect. So looking at my first derivative, it's not going to be undefined anywhere. So I'm going to have to figure out the zeros. And uh, I'm going to guess I'm going to factor out 4 first to make the numbers a lot smaller and nicer. Oh, dear. Now I'm going to have to factor that again. Unfortunately, we know what we're going to have to do. 1, negative 9, 24, negative 16. So, well, 16 has a lot less numbers than 64, so that's nicer. Let's see. Uh, I mean, let's just stick with 4, see if it keeps working. We'll make it our lucky number. Bring down the 1, 4, negative 5, negative 20, 4, 6. Hey, look at that. Okay, I did, absolutely did not remember any of these answers, so this is purely just luck. So factored form, so far we've got 4 and x minus 4, and then I've got x squared minus 5x plus 4. It's a lot of 4s today. This would be minus 4 minus 1. Noah, who is going to help me next? <laughs> oh, I, I was hearing that there was supposed to be another number chosen. 17, who's 17? That is a Tharva. Uh, so what are my critical numbers? Correct, 1 and 4. So I'm going to make my number line. I am not going to erase my derivative yet. Oh, uh, never mind. You guys wouldn't, don't need to erase anything. You have scratch paper. I'm going to make my number line with a 1 and a 4. And I'm going to figure out where it's increasing and decreasing. So I'm going to plug numbers into this factored one because that works a lot easier. So let's plug 0. So... 0 would be 4 times negative times negative times negative. That would give me a negative answer. Then I'm going to plug in 2. 2 would give me 4 times negative times negative times positive. That would be a positive answer. And then 10 would give me 4 times positive Positive, positive. Oh dear, this one's weird. Okay, so interval of increasing is from 1 to 4 and 4 to infinity. Interval decreasing is 0, uh, negative infinity to 1. And I'm going to have a relative. 
min at x equals 1. So I'm going to write it as a point because we're trying to make a graph. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. For an integral increasing, why can't we say 1, 2, and 30? Because it's not increasing at 4. Oh, okay. At 4, it has a slope of 0. Oh, okay. So it goes up, flat, up. No, that's a good question. Uh, so I'm going to plug 1 into the original function to see what I get. 1 minus 12 would be negative 11 plus 48. Oh, boy. 37. 37 minus 64, okay. Um, it's been a long time since I did do this. Negative 27. So my minimum is at 1, negative 27. 4 will not be anything. It's just going to be flat spot. Do you guys need me to leave any of that up there yet? Yeah. Can you just say we're all just linear factors? You can, but we have to graph it so a point will be convenient and helpful. That's the only reason I wanted it as a point. So, I mean, you're, you're not wrong. Uh, I, if I remember correctly on the test, I'm going to label it as a critical point instead of critical number so that you actually find the point. Like I said, nothing here individually is difficult. It's just super slow. There's a lot of stuff to find. Now you guys are back in the olden days. This is what math was like in the olden days. No calculators. The dark ages? Well, okay, it's, not, it's like the black and white ages, I guess. Jeez. Pre-color television. Who are we on? Farva. Fiona. I guess you're 31. What's the second derivative? Correct. I know I have it written really small. You can just read it off your paper. It's probably easier. Um, 12 plus 12. Good. Um, uh, 32 minus 17 plus 12 minus 6. Perfect. We definitely haven't moved smaller in numbers, have we? OK. So I believe 12 goes into all of them, though. So we've got x squared minus 6x plus 8. Good, I like that. No more synthetic division. x minus 4 minus 2. Oh, I forgot. Who is our expert in this hour for pips? Oh, that's right. We need a substitute expert. Cody? Well, how do we find pips? Maybe we should ask what a pip is first. Um, it's possible. Inflection possible inflection points. Okay. Um, how do we find them again? Well, no, it's the point of where the curve begins to go from. Um, like well, you're explaining what an inflection so point is. How do we find it on an equation? Isn't that also yep. similar to the first derivative of zero? <laughs> it's exactly the same as the first derivative one. So equal to zero are undefined, so it happens at four and two. So we have pips at x equals two and four. So I'm going to make a number line with two and four and look for concavity. So zero, I would get 12 times negative times negative. It gives me a positive concavity. 3, positive, negative, positive, so that will be negative. 5 or 10 or whatever, positive, positive, positive. Concave up from negative infinity to 2. And from 4 to infinity. Concave down from 2 to 4. 
And the last person. Um, 32. Lucas. How do I, f do I have any inflection points? Mm, I feel like that might be a bit vague. Do you remember how to look for one? Uh, we have an inflection point when it alternates concavity. Oh, then yeah. So, There's two of them done. Perfect. Yep. Both two and four are going to be inflection points because it alternates bef before and after both. So one inflection point will be at two something, and the other inflection point will be at four something. Now I have to figure out, oh, that's a big numbers. Two to the fourth is eight, no, 16. 16 minus, I need to erase, there's too much stuff here. Oh, wait, I just had a genius moment. Didn't we factor this into x, x minus four three times? I'm going to plug that into this instead of the original equation. That'll be a million times easier. So plugging in 2 would give me 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. Uh, yeah, negative 16. 4. 4 times, oh, I like this one. This one's nice. Oh, I should have known 4 0 because that was an x-intercept. Okay, we got a lot of information here. Now we need to draw it. So the very first thing you're always going to want to do, obviously, is find out everything before you even start. FYI, can anybody see a real problem with the derivative portion of this setup? If you make a mistake in your first derivative, every single thing down here is wrong. So when we take the test, I usually try to have it set up where like one problem I give you has the derivatives written in already, and then you find everything else from that. Because otherwise, it's near impossible for me to grade if you make a mistake at the beginning and then everything's wrong. OK, so we want to put actual points on there first. Because if you're making a drawing and you have actual points like that you have the number for, well, then our drawing has to go through them. So they're, they're kind of good guidelines. So I've got 0, 0, 4, 0. Oh, my goodness, these are tiny. Um, maybe I should go by ones up and down and go by a half a square. Because I can barely even see these lines on my screen. No, I'm going to pretend that I'm not old. Is that the middle? I think I got the middle on all of them. So I'm going by, um, I'm making this by ones left and right because they're so small for me. If you notice, we hardly have any large x values. So if, if I leave this by ones on mine, it's going to be extraordinarily crammed in. But I need to go down to negative 30 because we had a min-max at negative 27. So I'm just going to kind of label these by ones. Because I'm not going by one square, I'm going to label. So like this will be negative 10. Okay, you can set up your own graph however you want. I'm just, I'm setting it up so that I can make the use of the whole grid. But there, there isn't like a right or wrong way to do this. Okay, so 0, 0, and 4, 0 need to be points. Why don't I put those in blue? Nice contrast. 0, 0, 4, 0. Okay. 
Uh, Y-intercept is already done. End behavior. Now I'll wait to put those on, but that'll be easy. Uh, minimum at 1, negative 27 is my next actual point. Sully, I'm getting too old. I can't see where the grid lines are. A little bit. Do you know it's, it's Sully's birthday real soon? I believe it, it what is today? I think it's Saturday. Okay, so I have one negative 27 up there and I'm pretty sure it's at that point, but I can't tell. Then I have my inflection points. Two negative 16. That's an inflection point, and then four zero is an inflection point. Okay, now I have kind of like my, my guidelines for where important things happen on my graph, right? Like this is gonna be where my turns and curves happen at because they're inflection points, uh, mins, maxes. Uh, I'm gonna put my end behavior on next because that'll just give me a rough sketch of my picture. Goes up on both sides. Next, I'm going to draw increasing, decreasing. And you guys will want to do this just lightly because you're basically making a rough sketch of your graph while we put parts on there. So it decreases from... Decreases... Well, I lost it now. Negative infinity to 1. Okay, so it is going downwards through that point down to there. I can't really do, I can't do lightly on here, just the way it works. Pencil is definitely a lot easier for this. And it increases from one to four, so up, up, and from four to infinity, which I kind of already have drawn. Okay, so there's my super rough sketch. Down, up, up. And next I should probably draw curvature because I need to know where this is actually curving. So let's see, let me pick a different, <laughs> let me do like a light blue so I can draw on top of it. My graph is supposed to be curving upwards from negative infinity to two. So basically everything to the left of this spot should be curving upwards. And if I do that, There's rough, that's curving upwards, but following my increasing, decreasing. Then curving downwards from two to four. So my next little section is going upwards, but curving down. So I need to draw an upside down U, but going upwards. And then curving upwards again from four on. Okay, so there's my rough sketch with curvature. <clears throat> oh, I know what I forgot to do. I forgot to draw my critical numbers that had slopes of zero, but we kind of already knew those anyway. Um, if I would have done the slopes of zero, I would have drawn right here was supposed to be flat, and right here was supposed to be flat, but we did that. I'm basically just kind of like drawing all my little parts on here. And then my final graph is supposed to be, now that you have a bunch of light lines on yours, you can make a nice smooth line that goes through everything we did. And if you want to check yours, you can always graph it on the calculator afterwards to see if you did it right. And it should look pretty much like this. I guess mine is going to be a lot wider than yours because I stretched my scale. There was our 45 minute problem. Now, it should obviously go a lot faster, like if I don't call on people and like 
they definitely don't actually take 45 minutes. But I wanted to go through the steps with you on what we're going to do. Well, like I, like I told you, I already have some of it filled out for you on the test. And you're not always going to have to do synthetic division. OK, we'll stop there for today. But you, you guys definitely could try some of the polynomial curve sketching in the homework if you want.